go up here and just click on this. The Broom Art Trail, a wonderful idea by the Broom County Arts Council to show off the artists of Broom County. Unfortunately, that had to be canceled. But one of the sites on the art trail was the Cooperative Gallery 213. And we decided that since you can't come to us, we'd come to you. So that's the reason for our first Zoom presentation. So if there are a few glitches there, just uh, ride along with us. Sometimes the glitches are kind of fun. And at the end of our presentation, you will have a chance to meet with the artists and ask them questions or write questions in a, in a chat box. So if you're ready, here we come. The Cooperative Gallery 213 Zoom. And our first artist is Mary Rose Griffin, who will introduce herself and introduce the other artists participating in this art trail. Enjoy. Hi, welcome. My part of the show had to do with the pandemic because in March, the gallery closed and we wanted something to help pull the artists together and keep in contact. So Judy and I created something called the Challenge Circle. It was based on the game telephone or gossip where something starts and then it morphs as you go through the process. We invited all of the exhibiting gallery members to participate and eight of them took us up on it. So the 10 of us started. We picked the uh, order by random. The first person who started it was Betsy Jo Williams. And what we did is we introduced a piece of art. We passed it on to the next person, we passed it on to the next person, so on and so forth until we got to the end of 10 weeks. At the end of 10 weeks, we had 100 pieces of art, which we put on the front window of the gallery. I'm going to show you just one artist's work as it goes through time. This is the first piece that Betsy presented. It went to Jean Wongo, and she was inspired to create the piece you see on the right. Jeans went to Barb Bernstein, Barb Bernstein to Judy, Judy to Eileen Schlag, Eileen Schlag to Kit Ashman, Kit Ashman to Karen Cuff D'Amico, Karen Cuff D'Amico to Jeff, <coughs> and Jeff Gould to me, and finally from me to Carolyn Gilligan. As you can see from the images, there were no restrictions on the media they used. There was no restriction on size or actual image. The only thing we asked is they give us their inspiration, whatever it is, whatever was inspired by the image that they received. It was so successful that the members who are part of the 10 week circle asked us to do it again. This time we invited all the supporting members as well. And we ended up with 12 people who wanted to do it. So with Judy and I, 14, and we decided 14 weeks was too long. So we ran two seven week series concurrently. Nobody's really seen them all put together. I will be doing that hopefully in the near future, but I definitely will be doing it. As I mentioned a little bit earlier when I first started speaking is that we put these images in the front window. And when I drove by, I realized they looked like a quilt. So the part that I'm working on right now is actually transferring these images to cloth and creating a quilt, which hopefully will be a fundraiser for the gallery. That's it. And I'm going to now pass you on to Betsy Jo Williams. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my presentation is called My Studio because what I actually did was take a little bit of my own studio and brought it into the Cooperative Gallery. Had the pandemic not hit and people were coming in, the tables there because I would be doing some linoleum block printing with people that would come in to see it. But that didn't happen. So what I want to point out right now is that most people think of me as being a sculptor. 
because that's what most of the work that I've shown has been sculptors. And here's, a, here's me at my studio working on a piece. The piece ended up being this piece, which was called Fragments. It was part of a show. Uh, and that certainly is a fragmented horse if I ever saw one. This is another horse that I did. I use, to get myself going, I use sticks, stones, whatever I can find that gives me an idea. And you'll see that reflected in the pieces. Uh, for example, this is a monkey, a female primate. She's pregnant, in case you can't tell. Uh, and this came after I uh, came back from a trip to Africa. This is my last sculpture I'm going to show you right now. And I like to point out that I think this is best representative of the, of the kind of work that I do. I'm certainly not a realist, I'm not an impressionist, but I do think that I, my natural way of doing things is to be uh, someone who does expressionism. So keep that in the back of your mind as you're looking at the rest of my work. Not just sculptures, I also like to do drawing. These are some drawings. I pinned these up in the gallery just like they were pinned up in my studio wall. The first, the top three pieces, the two large ones and the little one are self-portraits. I always said, who's the best model you can get? And I decided that was me because I never complain with myself. And when I say, look at the mirror, I look at the mirror. Now the next couple of slides are gonna show you are gonna be pieces that came from Mary Rose's uh, challenge program. I decided that when I got my piece, I was gonna work in uh, block prints, something I don't normally do, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. This is a linoleum block print and it came from a piece that I got from someone else that might've been from Carolyn that was uh, llamas. So I went on and did a block print of a llama this was a block print that I did after I got a series of uh, portraits from people. And this actually is my grandson, he's fishing. This is from a photograph I took of him. I kind of like this piece. Uh, someone sent me whatever the picture was, was of an ocean with seabirds. So I inspired me to do this. And this is the last block print I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is when I shifted gears over to decide that what I wanted to do was some things to do with, the, with the, uh, the times that were in the pandemic. So I did this block print. And the next thing I did was I decided to try doing some mono prints. For those of you who uh, know what a mono print is, it is uh, when you put ink on a plate. Oops, wait a second here. When you do ink on a plate and then the whole plate's covered with ink, you wipe away with a cloth or whatever have you, the places you want to be white, and you end up with an image, which is what you'll see on the left-hand side. That was my first one. This is my granddaughter. Um, it's a, not a true mono, it's a, the first one is called a monotype. monotype. And then if you do more, they're called mono prints. So the second one that you'll see on the right-hand side is when I went back to the plate after it had been printed, re-inked it again, and printed it a second time. You'll see they aren't exactly the same. Self-portrait. Well, do I look like I'm going through a pandemic right there, don't I? <laughs> and this was, a, this was an image that I really liked the eyes. It was a full face image that I started off with and then I decided to put a uh, mask on him. This is my last image. When I can't get myself to model, I go to the next best thing, that's my husband. So he's been very patient about sitting there and putting on masks and doing all kinds of silly things that I can, I can, uh, I can uh, use him as a model. That's my show. Here I am. Those of you who don't know me, you'll have a face to put with my work. Uh, I hope you get a chance to come down and see the gallery when we open again. Remember at the end of this presentation, we're gonna have a question and answer period. And I hope it goes smooth. And here is our next person. We have Judy Salton. Take it away, Judy. Thanks, Betsy. Well, I've decided to show, relatively speaking, because if any of you saw our last show, you knew that I did a lot of political work. It was called um, Politicians Play Games. Well, I wanted to get away from that, especially now that we're getting so close to the election. So I started going through 
works that I had from before. And I came across artwork that would take me away from that these moments we have now into a quieter time. And so this is what I showed. I showed pieces from various points in my life. And some of them are my relatives, some of them are Mary Rose's relatives, and some are just uh, animals that live on my street from a different show that I did. And this is what I look like now. Betsy showed herself. Well, here's my portrait that I did in pencil. And as you can see, it's, a rel it's my self-portrait 2020. Now I'd like to show you an earlier portrait of myself. This is Canadian Air Express. Um, for several years, when I was between two and four, somewhere along that time, I lived in Canada, in Mosier River, Canada. Mosier River is a town on the east coast of Canada. It's a tidal river. And right now it has a population of 323. I think about the time I lived there, it might've had a few more, a few less, but pretty much the same amount. And I was lucky enough to go back up with my mother and Mary Rose in the nineties and the house is still standing and the, the land around it is. And I got to actually, um, I actually took some pictures and did some prints of it and sent it to the relatives that I have in Canada. This is a picture of my mother, Teresa, and when she was a little girl. And uh, I was lucky enough to have her write her memories of when she was a child. And there's one that's especially poignant right now. And I'd like to read from her book that she wrote. It's just a little notebook that she wrote in freehand. It's not a real published book, but she tells me about her childhood. So I'm going to read from that now. One morning, I remember sitting at the table having breakfast with my cousins, Billy, Georgie, and May. Aunt May called me in to my mother's bedroom. She was holding a lighted candle and praying. I don't remember how my mother looked, but I rushed out of the house and ran to Aunt Anna's. She lived in Sheridan Avenue, a few blocks from us. I told her my mother was dead. I don't know how I got back home but I wouldn't go into the living room to see my mother until Aunt Anna came. I don't remember the funeral. Well, my mother moved several places after her mother died. She, first she was with her father for a while and then she went with Aunt May. And then she ended up with Aunt Anna, who by the way, I've always considered to be my grandmother and I call her Nana. I always thought it was that I wasn't saying Aunt Anna right, but no, she was really like my grandmother because she helped raise my mother. And while my mother, my mother writes, while I was living with Aunt Anna, there were boxes piled between her house and the funeral parlor, which was next door. This was a time of the flu epidemic and so many people were dying. They were just buried in rough boxes. I understand my mother died of the flu. So it's very apropos right now, I think, to be reading this and to think about it. I'm picking up my mother's, my mother's book and rereading it at that time. It must have been horrible then because it's horrible now. It's not moving forward. Sorry, another technical glitch. Thank you. And this is Mary Rose, Rosie. Um, she's my wife of the last five years. We've been together for 44. And this is her home. This is a front room, they call. There were two living rooms in this house. So this is the front room. And uh, we're working on it right now. The house is in need of repair. But as I, when I lived in the house, when we started living in there, I started going through old boxes they had of photographs. And the subsequent pictures that you'll see are ones that really intrigue me from the box of photographs that I found. This one is Poppy. This is Mary Rose's maternal grandfather and he's raking leaves. And what I wanted out of this, this is a Conte crayon. I wanted the feeling of when you're raking, the time in between when you pulled the last bunch of leaves and were just ready to start for the next. And when I felt that I had achieved that for myself, I went on to the next one. Again, this is Poppy sitting on the blanket 
And Mary Rose's grandmother is the one on the far left and her uncle Tom, who was their son and his wife, Margaret are sitting in the middle. Uh, Margaret died when I was, before I met Mary Rose, but I, get, I did get to know Uncle Tom, a really nice guy. And I found this in the box too. As a matter of fact, I found several pictures of these three women who would get in the car and go all, all over the place. They were driving. This is in the 20s and 30s, and I doubt that too many women just got together and started out on road trips, but I'm calling it road trip. Actually, this particular one you can see is pretty brightly colored. I was working with Angelo Apollido at the time, and if any of you know Angelo, you know he really worked with color. And they were living on Double Day Street, and uh, I got a grant from the United Cultural Fund to do uh, uh, an installation on Doubleday Street. I had it outdoors because I felt that too many people had never gone to art galleries and I wanted to show them. So I did 20 pieces. I did black and white pictures of what the, uh, Doubleday Street was like in the 1950s. And then I did these cutouts. What I did is I took a photograph of the dog. I measured it as to what the actual photo, uh, size of the dog was, I painted it on plywood and then I cut it out. So these are freestanding. And this is Diva. Diva was across the street neighbor and Diva lived with, <laughs> glitch, <laughs> Fred. <laughs> and these were both rescue dogs that our next door neighbor took in. Now, both of these have passed away, but the dogs are still on the front porch and they stay out there all the time. They've been there since 2006. And recently, and this is going to be my last slide, they were joined by Stella. And Stella is still alive and she's living across the street. She was very sick at one time and they thought they were going to lose her. So I rushed to get Stella done. Luckily, she, she pulled through and I got it done in time. It was just in time for the man who lives across the street birthday. So that's the last of my series. I'm now going to turn it over to Chuck, and you can see his work. Good evening, everybody. Sorry for all the glitches here today, and we're just doing the best we can. And yeah, um, I apologize for my series of, of pictures here. They're going to be all lost square. And it, it, it's not the way the format was supposed to be, but we couldn't get a fish, couldn't get the new one to load properly. So anyway, so use your imagination. This is a tall vertical picture. Anyway, the theme on my show for the arts world is water. Water is what sustains us. It's part of our lives in so many ways. The trip, the rain, the flow, the waves. What else do we get to experience, explore, and enjoy over and over again? Every time I'm out taking photographs, I always find myself always looking for water. How can I get water into a photograph? This is um, from a scene in, in the, the, the highlands of Scotland, a mountain stream where it was a very long exposure. Um, and it'd be kind of taken out of context here because you're not seeing the top and bottom of the photograph. Sorry about that. Uh, same with this one. This is um, along a beach in northern England. It's um, waves coming in. Uh, this is the only one that, that looks the way it's supposed to look. It, uh, it's, a, it's an image of um, rain on uh, it's a double-decker bus. And this is the top. I always love riding, riding the bus when I live in London. And, 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 and always, I always try to get up top, get right in front of the big glass window. Number one, you got the great view, and number two, you have an opportunity to take pictures. And this is the one, the one that I made with the water droplets against the pane of glass. This is another speed scene with, 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 with a wave coming in again. The square crop doesn't do it touches. Um, this is again it's another scene in um, in Iceland. And I was there a few years ago um, with the reflection in a pond. Um, how you can make water to make your picture more interesting, better. Um, what I always like about photographing in Iceland, if you don't like your sky, just wait five minutes and you have, have a whole new sky to deal with because the skies in Iceland are constantly changing. 
So if you don't like the cloud formation, just wait and you'll, you'll get a better cloud formation coming along. Um, early one morning, went for a walk uh, with a mist in the morning uh, with water drops on a fern. And I'm gonna end it with a picture of my grandson who was, um, this is a setup photo it was used for the sounded circle that we always, that, that Mary Rose talked about. I asked him to get in the middle of the boat to, um, to be in a dreamlike state. Again, you're not gonna really see that here because the, um, again, it's about square. You're not getting the, the full feel of the water surrounding the boat. And, and if you were able to see it, you see there's no tether at all. So he's out there, looks like it could be in the middle of nowhere. Somebody asked earlier when they saw this photo, um, was, was he afraid or, or, or how, how he, was, he was getting away from us? Well, if you, you can't see it, but there is a rope tied to the bow of the boat that's under the water to the dock. So as he was floating away from me and when I was done, I was able to pull him back in, much to his relief. So I wanna thank you and um, we're gonna pass it on to Kit. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. <clears throat> well, I'm the only one that can see you, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So, um, <clears throat> this has been an interesting evening. Um, my name is Kit, and this is my, my show is called Friends, Family, and Pets. I started uh, doing art when I retired, probably about 10 years ago. And I had not really done any since the time I was in seventh grade when somebody insulted me and told me that I didn't know what I was doing and that I was pretty shallow in my work. So I just stopped. And so I thought I'd try it again. And I hired Catherine Niles, whom everybody knows here, to come to my house and we, she, we started to draw together. That, emer that um, evolved into what I really want to do, which was to paint. Um, so my work basically are, I enjoy painting more than I like anything. And I also enjoy uh, printmaking, which I've been doing. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, I have to show something? Yes. I push this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so my first painting is my, uh, and I tend to do things that I love or people that I love or that has something to do with what's going on in my life at the time. This is Bella, um, my dog who died a few years ago. And I, she used to stand in the garden and just look out over everything. So I was experimenting at this time with a new technique for me, which was to use a palette knife. And this came together very quickly. Um, because I think it felt like a sculpture. I could actually feel the contours of her body as I painted, which I think is part of what happens for me when, I, um, when I'm working. So we'll go on, dot, dot. This one, it, this is a, a, an oil painting and it's uh, 70 by 48, I think, or 40. And this is my daughter, Marcy. Um, I, I was learning about how to paint um, with many, many, many layers, uh, starting with the darks and the lights and, and continuing and adding layer after layer. The picture itself has to do with my daughter, Marcy, who is a uh, brilliant woman who has many interests. And at this point, she was making a very big change in her life. Um, she was trying to find the light in her life. And she has become a, she's, be, she's now a, a yoga teacher and is doing a really nice job. But I, I spent a lot of time on this and, and it actually took me almost a year to do this painting. So that was quite a challenge. Um, so I'll move on to the next. So the other medium that I work in is printmaking. And this is a, uh, one of the ways in which we do printmaking is, and I do it with Alexandra Davis at her studio. This is called Portals. It's a colograph. Well, a colograph is, is put together by adding layer after layer. It's very similar to doing a collage. 
um, and you have a piece of cardboard or some sort of a, a what do you call it, a piece of cardboard, and you find all kinds of things that have um, texture and so forth, and you you think you're, it's going to come out a certain way, and it comes out quite differently. Um, with practice, you begin to know what's going to be dark and what's going to be light, and you put you put all this texture on a piece of uh, cardboard and then you put a lot of ink on and then you begin to rub it off and uh, and eventually you put it through the press and you hope for the best and it's always a surprise that's one of the things now portals has to do with uh, I think what we're going through now which is uh, going through a long tunnel I'm not quite sure where we're all going to come out This is my granddaughter, Amanda. This is a mono print because the original, there's, I have another one of her, which was the first version of her. Betsy talked about how, the difference between monotype and mono print. Um, basically, you paint the image onto your, uh, what, what do you call it? The, uh, plastic thing that you do, plexiglass. the plexiglass. And uh, she had come to visit us. She would be humiliated if she thought I had painted her. She just really wants no part of this. But I also found her to be a very, very deep and interesting young woman as we spent time together. And so the shadow, which is the um, ghost of the original monotype, and this is the monoprint that came afterwards, I decided to move her to the side and just have the uh, shadow of her. She has a shadow, she's, got, she's a deep thinker, and I think this indicates another side of her. This is probably more about me than anything. I was having, I had piled a whole bunch of uh, art magazines art, that I had, and I was interested in the idea of the passing of time and aging, which seems to be a major, major um, discussion that we have just about every day of our lives at this point, uh, along with the COVID. So this really, I, I, I just kept ripping and finding beautiful, beautiful hands. You notice there's some really aged hands. And if you look in the mirror, you can see that there's a young person. And this has to do with um, the passage of time and becoming elderly, but also still having a lot of life. This was a uh, painting I did over the summer after taking a workshop uh, using a new medium of uh, uh, cold wax. And it, I had planted peonies. My peonies were in full bloom. I treated this with the, with, uh, the idea that this is also a figure. I like doing figures and that um, and I used the new strategy of being very loose and using a lot of paint and starting with lots of lines and just hoping that it all comes out. It went very quickly. The yellow hat, um, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I, I often have a friend of mine, I, she, her face comes up in a lot of my images, but we were standing in the rain and she had this amazing yellow hat. And I remember some of the artists of, uh, you know, some of the artists that I really admire are Renard, Diebenkorn and Haim Soutine and some of the impressionists. But I remember um, Haim Soutine had a number of, he had a beautiful painting of a woman in a red hat. So I really enjoyed the beauty of this hat as well as the beauty of the person who is wearing it, who is standing in the rain. And I, 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 this went rather quickly because I used a lot of um, loose and, and not really getting really tight. And that's really the direction I wanna go. I don't think I've achieved it yet, but we're, we're getting there. This is my husband, Michael. Um, I had been, uh, going through the magazine of Haim Soutine, and not magazine, but his his uh, the the catalog that I had of him, and that's where I was at that time. And if you look at his hands and his face and some of the skin and everything, there's a lot of color. It's really just fun, and um, I'm a little bit about Michael. This is a position he's in very very often. It's very typical of him to have his hand to his chest bending over his plate of spaghetti and in total, it's, it's a type of meditation, I think, and he just is in total bliss. This was a fun painting and I actually really uh, think it's kind of good. Anyway, let's go. 
I think that might be my land. Oh no. Well, this happened during the, um, this is a portraits of me, three faces. What else can you do in the time of the pandemic, pandemic, except look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh my God. So that's kind of what this is all about. I was also, again, experimenting with uh, using cold wax and oil paint. And this is what came of it. Now I would like to introduce Linda. Please help me again. Chalello. Chalello. Now do I push this button or does she? Here we go. That was horrible. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is my painting. This is my name is Linda Chalello. And I'm approaching this a little bit differently than everybody else here, I think, because I've been doing this all of my life. And my, my take on this is way back 50 years ago, I decided that um, the most important thing I could do is learn how to produce what I was seeing in my mind. And so my focus is on form. And um, being a realist, I find beauty in simply depicting the things that I see. And there's a particular focus on light and reflections and um, the way that you can make something look three-dimensional when it's actually two-dimensional. So... I let the, like handwriting, I just try to reproduce what I'm seeing. And then I let my own personality come through because it never looks, of course, exactly like what everybody else is seeing. This is just the still life of, you know, a rose. And um, I think probably I like the vase better than the rose. And um, this is oil paint. And I've only been oil painting for about 20 years. About 15 years ago, I decided that oil paint was the only serious medium. And so I tried real hard to learn how to oil paint. But then circumstances happened and I had to uh, go to work. And so I didn't get much chance to paint. But I sold a lot of this type of thing on eBay about 15 years ago. And so I have some left over. And when you see the still lifes, a lot of these are old, but. Okay, this one is recent and I really love painting people. And this is oil paint. And this is actually the first oil painting that I have finished that I am pleased with. This is about two years old. And I, the most problem I had with oil paint is the color. And with this, I, I finally found what they call the Zorn palette, which is just Anders Zorn is a, a painter from the 1800s. And he paints with just red, yellow, black, and white. And I found that if I just used those colors and limited my palette, that I could focus on form. And I'm, form is very important to me. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it worked. This one is the Zorn palette with cobalt violet and cadmium green, because I tried to find a way to make the cool shadows without getting too cool, because invariably, if I use blue, my figures will get too much blue in them. So I'm happy with this. I like her face. Um, I like the way she, she looks tired. She looks defiant. It says what I want it to say. And there's a lot of good detail in the blouse and the necklace that I, I really enjoy. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Okay, this one is Mandy. Uh, this one I did about a year and a half ago. And it was accepted into a show in New York. It's the first one that I've ever entered. And I'm, I was very pleased to have that in that show. This is also the Zorn palette. This is my neighbor, Mandy Bixby. And she, she sat for me. I paid her and uh, she was delightful. And um, 
I'm just very pleased with this one. I like the hands and the face, the, the important part. Okay, this is a, a still life left over from 15 years ago where I was trying to learn how to paint. And um, I like the light in this. I did a lot of these because they're very easy. You know, I just thought I have to paint something. I've got to find something to paint. And I just set them up and until I liked them and painted them. So there's, there's no deep significance in here or deep meaning, there's no symbolism. This one though, I call one bad apple because you know, the apples and the pears, but nevertheless, it's, it's basically just an exercise. Now this one is the same kind of thing, except that I'm using different, a different color for this. This is yellow and blue where the other one was red. No red in this one, so. It's a color composition thing, once again with light. And of course that blue vase trying to get it look that, get that translucent look of sun shining through a vase full of water, which I, I'm, I'm, you know, I must be part crow because I love shiny things. So that one too, same kind of thing, different angle. Um, I like the folds and the fabric. I like the reflection, reflections in the shadows Shadows are really important to me because you've got the regular shadows that, that make the form, and then you've got the reflected light, which is the pretty part, so. And this one is very recent. This is a colored pencil drawing that I just did as a commission. And this is um, Helen Insinger's granddaughter, and she wanted her done. So I, I went over, she, she was visiting for a while this summer and I went over and photographed her at her house and took it home and just finished this one just this week. And I'm very pleased with it. And it's just, it's wax pencil. And this is the kind of thing I did for many, many years up in Casanova. Um, I did hundreds, literally hundreds of commissions of this type. But my name at that time was Linda Vredenberg. So um, anyway, I think that's it, right? Okay. Oh, oh, there is another one. Okay, I forgot about this one. This one is a pastel drawing. This one also went to New York after the other one. Uh, we just, we went and picked this up right when COVID was just starting. And this is a pastel drawing and my model is Rhea, she lives in California now. And um, I was experimenting with color. This one I used all the pencils that had the word flesh on them. And then I've got another one after this. Okay, this one is also Rhea, but this one was done with just red, yellow, blue, black, and white. In other words, this is more of an impressionistic if you know anything about Marie Cassatt, that's the way that she worked. She would just throw pure color into her, her drawing and then just you know put white or black in with it. And I really, I would rather do this particular kind. I think the skin turned out better. The colors <clears throat> are better, they're more luminous, but it's harder to do because you have to, uh, you have to take chances. So I think that's all. Okay. Well, thanks for coming along on our own Broom Arch Trail right here in the gallery. Our first Zoom presentation. And when everything opens up again, remember we're at 213 State Street and keep your eye out for our next Zoom presentation. If you can't come to the art, the art will come to you. Thanks again. Okay, we're going to open this up now for questions and answers. We're sorry that we had some glitches in the beginning. Our first time, we will learn from those in the future. So let me see what I can do here about getting this out of the way. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, here we are. Great, Great job, Betsy. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
uh, we're all here. So if anyone has any questions specifically for one person or the other, feel free to ask that. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna look to see if we have anything in our chat box. And apparently we do. Uh, Bill has gotten some, some thumbs up for being really great. Uh, <laughs> Peg has a compliment for us. Thank you, Peg. You do. Nice job, Betsy. Thank you. And I know that we ran into some problems. Uh, one thing that we did learn is that we need to have everything totally up and ready to go, you know, days right. before we go on live on it. So that was part of our problem. So that's the story there. Uh, okay. Anyone have questions they'd like to ask any of the artists? Yes, Eileen Schlag. Um, I wanted to ask Linda, if you could sort of briefly uh, explain her lighting techniques. How does she light the figures when she draws them? Okay. I, when you draw them. <laughs> okay, well, I, if it's a figure, I do take a photograph, unless I'm working at the, doing a life drawing. But I have, it's all set up in my studio. Me too. Uh, traditionally, you use one light, on one, on one side and use a reflector on the other side. And uh, you know, the thing is that you want light. Okay, when you take a photo, the contrast is always higher than what you will see. The light is too light and the darks are too light, too dark. Okay, so if you take a photo because your eyes adjust to the, the light part and the dark part when you look yep. at it. You know, you, you get to, <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you put a mirror on the other side or, you know, a professional photographer will use a, an umbrella or any kind of a reflector, you have the best, the easiest way to do it is one light from one side and the reflector from the other. Now the one that the painting of Shelby there, I did something different. I put a warm light on one side and a blue light on the other side. And there are some artists who are doing some very good work. Actually, what they do is they'll take a light and cover it with a dry cleaner bag on one side. So that one side is blue and one side is warm. And it produces really interesting shadows. If you look at this one of uh, Shelby, you will see that there's actually two light sources and that fascinates me. I, um, what it does is it shows all the planes of the figure. It gives you a lot of information about the shape of the person that you're drawing or painting. And I found, I am working right now, I'm working from a tablet. I used to work from prints because I did children for a long time. And of course, obviously children don't sit. So they would come to my house and I would put them beside a window with a mirror on the other side. And I would use my 35 millimeter camera and I would get to take 36 pictures. And they would be a tiny little, you know, five by eight things. And I would have to do the, the drawing from those. Now, I don't, I don't work from prints, I work from a tablet. And I found that working from a screen is a lot better than working from a print. And a lot of the artists today are doing that. A lot of them won't tell you, but. <laughs> you know. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody have any questions about any of their work? I do want to mention the fact that I, I am giving a plug to my friend, uh, Alexander Davis, because that's the print studio that uh, several of us here go to. It's in uh, Endwell. And and well, Endicott, Endicott, yeah. So you can look her up and her, the name of the studio is Equinox. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Anything else? We just, we covered everything so well, no one has anything to ask us? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Bill. All right. Yeah, I've heard a number of artists, and Kit mentioned this, I heard a number of artists mention that they have to loosen up. Uh, I think that was the phrase that she used. And uh, I've always wondered exactly what that meant as far as 
the effect on their artwork or why they felt that they had to do that? I'm putting my hands up here to see if anyone wants to answer that question. <laughs> and kids coming up. <laughs> Well, actually, I think probably I need to tighten up because I am so loose, but um, <laughs> in general. And for me, I think it just is a, a feeling of spontaneity. It's a sense of using your body as well as uh, concentrating on little small things, uh, using your arm, uh, you know, moving in, moving out, moving in, and just things happen when you do that that are a little different than concentrating on a, a part of the painting or just concentrating on a small part of the painting. So there's mm -hmm. like a combination of those two things that help me. I'm more loose than I am tight, actually. I mean, wait, well, no, that's not right. Anyway, <laughs> that's one of those glitches you were talking about. <laughs> okay, so that for me, that's what it means. Just, you know, using more of a gesture, uh, not worrying, um, being somewhat spontaneous, and then you find out what you did when you're done. I want to just piggyback off what you said about being spontaneous. Someone that I worked with once said, and I'm not a singer, trust me, my voice, I'd never be a singer. But they said that if you're singing, if you're on stage singing, you can't analyze how you're singing. You just got to do it. So when you're working, sometimes you can't say, well, you know, is my line too dark? Is this too that? You have to just let it happen. And that might be one of the responses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And thank you, Bill. You did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else anything they would like to ask us? I can't tell uh, how many people. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, I was just thinking that just, I mean, it's wonderful presentation. But I'm wondering in the in the final. So is this has been recorded? Will this be the final thing that that's presented? And will the the little vignettes of of the um, the speakers or the artists will they be part of it? And will our images also be part of it? I'm just curious. I'll talk to our technical support and have them work out those details for us. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're recording this. Okay. Yes, Mike. Um, yeah, and everything does get recorded. Whatever you see is what gets recorded. But I have a question for Chuck. If he could say more about that long exposure thing and what you have to, how you have to adjust that to not get overexposed. Hi, Peg. Want to repeat that question, please? The question is to ask you to explain more about the long exposure so that you could see the water right. what, what happened, kind of moving. Yes, and what, and what, is there a limit to that? Yes, and what, yes. what do you have to do to make that happen? Um, a spare <laughs> minute. <laughs> okay. um, because daylight's often so bright, you can't, you can't afford it to do to, to, you know, to two minute exposures. So what you have to do is to use a, what's called a density filter on your lens. Which, which it darkens the lens up. So therefore it, it, it blocks out a lot of the light that forces you have to use a longer exposure. And what happens is that when, when you have moving water like that, it moves it right out, it can give it a kind, kind of a classy feeling, which is, you can make it really neat. As long as you've seen something around it that, that puts it into perspective. I know most of you have probably seen the image up on the wall here of my past show because that print is, um, it gets purple, right? Let's go to it. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. So there it is. Um, you can see it's a good, you know, four, you know, three and a half feet wide by six feet in length, and it's printed on fabric, which came out very nicely. But what I really like about it is that is that you really have good detail in 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 your rocks. And there's the nice really smooth bars, and then there's your, your smooth water we're talking about. And as for what exposure you want to use, how long do you want to go, if there really isn't any um, clear indication of that, you kind of have to experiment. So what I do is that is I, I take several different time exposures. I just keep the shutter open for a different length of time, anywhere from 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a minute and a half to two minutes. And, 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 and um, 
to really get the how I want the water to look. So that that's the best way to to, to, make, to make that come. That's the best way. To make it Thank you. But of course, when you're doing that, you're you're working on a um, a tripod because you have to keep the image total total still for that long exposure time. Great. Hey Chuck, I got a question for you too. Yeah. Uh, I noticed all you, all your work is black and white. Do you can you comment on that? Sure, sure. Um, as most of you know, I worked in, in at the Photo Journalist for years, shooting everything that was happening around us here in our community and other communities where I worked too. And and when I basically uh, stopped working at the paper doing daily photojournalism type of stuff, I really wanted to get into fine artwork. And I just really got tired of color. You know, we all grew up um, with color. We're surrounded by color. Uh, we see everything in color for the most of us uh, do. So I decided just wanted to strip away those colors and just get it right back to get back down to, to the black and to get right down to the gray images, you know, the different shades of gray from your pure white to your pure black and everything in between. And that's just the way, you know, a lot of detraction in, in the image and, and what it pulls out, what I feel that I, I will want an, an image to portray. Mm, nice. Anything else for me? Yeah, question. Um, Chuck, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Jeff. Um, do you ever do, um, when you're doing water and movement, do you do multiple images and then sandwich them together? Uh, no, I don't. Um, it, it, I know that that's a technique people do, but I'd like to try to keep things as pure as possible. Um, especially today because there's so much, you know, with, 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 with these cell phones today, what they can do is absolutely amazing. And, and, and you know, everybody's a photographer today, which is good, I like that. I like people have been able to see and seeing how to make their image go. But let's keep the, um, let's, keep, let's keep all the, um, what do you want to call it, the toys away, you know, all the special filters people could use. You know, right now there's all those things out there where people can take, where we're at, they can use art, artificial intelligence to take away background images. Um, so it, it, you know, I saw a picture poster the other day, somebody posted with a deep, deep, deep blue sky and it wasn't a deep blue sky, you know, they, they made that using, you know, one of their, 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 their filters, one, one of the, probably a Photoshop program. And it, 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 you know, it's just a shame that I can go out and take a really dull image and go back and Photoshop and make it anything I want. Um, for me, as, as a photographer, I'm I, I really a strong believer of it, 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 that you should shoot the image for what you're seeing when you're at the scene and try not to, to play around with it so much that you're changing it completely. Then, but with that being said, let me say I have plenty of photographer friends who are doing some wonderful things in Photoshop, doing some really stuff that I really like a lot, that, that, that putting everything I just said uh, to change. And that, um, so, you know, it's up to the artist and what you want to portray. But if you are using a lot of Photoshop and a lot of, I mean, stacking images on top of one another, and all that kind of stuff. I, I think somehow or another, you, you, you just, you know, in your artist statement, you should make that point out. So that people really have a reality of, of how and what you're shooting. Anything else for me? Got those questions? Okay, back to Betsy. Okay, anybody else have any questions for anyone else? I have oh, go ahead, Karen. Oh, I was just going to ask if um, Mary Rose and Judy had thought about doing another challenge circle. Yes, the answer to Judy is yes. <laughs> okay. Give us a little time to get the other two out first, <laughs> and then we'll go ahead and start one. Maybe either the end of this year or the very beginning of next year. It was supposed to be October, but October got kind of 
more into finding out how to do the Zoom presentation than anything. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> then you get the holidays, whatever they end up being. <laughs> Uh, our presentation would have been the one thing I learned tonight was the fact that you have to have everything totally up and proofed a good time beforehand because you can't change things the last minute uh, or else we wouldn't have had the glitches this time. So yeah, we need we need about yeah. a week before to have yeah, it all right. tidied up. So, anybody want to say anything here? I don't really care too much if there were if there were glitches or not. I really appreciate seeing the artists talking about their art, and that was very thank valuable. I want and to. Thank I, I hope you do this more often, Stefan. I want to thank you. Just watching Bill and you work together was kind of a trip in itself. So, <laughs> those of you who don't know, Stefan did the photography. Uh, of Bill in the beginning, and just coming in with all his equipment was an eye opener for us. Yeah. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Stefan and uh, Linda's show is coming up next, so everyone should try to get get involved in that. And Mary Rose did the PowerPoint presentation. And Mar Mary Rose what? Did the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, and I thank Mary Rose for doing the PowerPoint presentation for all of this. It was no small thing. I'd, so, I'd like to just say thank you to Betsy for the energy and everything that you put into this. Yes, Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, might, you might not be a technical person, but I'm I'm brave. Brave, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'm brave. You know, you're loose. <laughs> you're loose. Yeah. And that's that's the way you have to be. It's fun to uh, it's fun to watch people deal with problems and how they, you know, take the glitches and everything. And I think you did a wonderful job. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, you and know, you get it, right? another year if it were the same show, that would be a whole different thing. But this is the beginning. It's like you know, you're Columbus out in the middle of the ocean, and they just threw away all the navigation equipment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where, where are we? What do we do? How do we get where we want to go? Well, you make it up. And, uh, I'm getting seasick. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thank you, all. Thank you very much for this. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Great job. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, I am this thing now. Oh, I can't.